All right, so this is chapter three. This chapter deals with macromolecules. Um, so we'll be going through lots of uh, what does it mean to be an organic molecule and what are the macromolecules, the four different kinds. All right, so let's begin. Uh, this cartoon is, uh, you know, these early chemists are describing the first dirt molecule, so it's kind of cute dirt. And uh, you can see that they have double bonds and single bonds between their little dirt symbols. Um, so what is organic molecules or organic compounds? These are carbon-based molecules. And let me just start off by saying that the word organic is used in different ways. Um, in our culture, the word organic is used to refer to foods that have been grown without the use of pesticides or herbicides. So there isn't any treatment or man-made chemical treatment to um, keep away pests or to keep away unwanted weeds. Um, so organic vegetables and organic fruits, that word organic doesn't mean the same thing as what we're talking about here. In organic chemistry, if you ever have to take organic chemistry, you're taking a, a chemistry class that only deals with organic molecules. And what is an organic molecule? It's a carbon-based molecule. So they talk about mm, these carbon-based molecules as having a carbon backbone or skeleton. And then, um, so here's that word carbon skeleton. And there's carbons that are linked together. And then attached to those carbons can be different atoms. But the, the true definition is carbon and hydrogen. So for an organic molecule to be organic, it has to contain carbon and hydrogen. Okay, so C and H. Um, and we'll look at that um, a little bit more carefully. But let's go through the outline. So um, letter A is that you have a carbon-based skeleton, and the skeletons are chains of carbon molecules bonded together. Um, and carbon... Um, is unique. It has a tetravalence. So it can bond to four different atoms or it basically it has four empty seats for an electron. So it wants to make four bonds and that's called a tetravalence. Okay. So because of this unique tetravalence, it can form different shapes of molecules. And when it comes to biological systems, the shape of a molecule is critical for what it does and how your body reacts to it. So it's all about the shape. Um, so when you have um, carbon, uh, the skeletons can vary in their size, how long they are, if they have branching, or if they can form rings. So let me show you some of the bonding here. So you should be familiar now with covalent bonds. Covalent bonds are sharing electrons between two atoms. And we looked at how a line represents um, a covalent bond between two atoms. Right, so they're sharing in a single bond, right? So if we're looking at this carbon here in orange in the middle, it can form four bonds. So we should see four lines coming off of the carbon. So one, two, three, four. I kind of left these blank here, okay? So this carbon has one, two, three, four single bonds. So each of those represents one of those empty seats of one of the um, electrons that it wants to bond with. So it's, being sh it's sharing an electron with something else. So that's filling the seat. So a carbon can make four single bonds, or if you look at this orange carbon, it can make two double bonds. It's still four, right? So we're still filling up those four empty um, spots where the electrons want, the carbon wants to fill. And so this is perfectly acceptable, right? Carbon can make two double bonds. It can also make two, uh, uh, one double bond and two single bonds, anything that adds up to four. A triple bond is present here. Um, I'm not sure actually if this happens in real life, but theoretically it does. You can have a triple bond and a single bond, okay? So as long as you have four um, bonds, the carbon is happy. Um, out of these, I mentioned this in chapter two, which kind of bond Single, double, or triple, do you think is the strongest between two atoms, the hardest to break? And you would probably infer that the more electrons two atoms share, the more tied they are together, and it's harder to break. And that's true. So the strongest bond is the triple bond, and the weakest bond is the single bond. However, 
covalent bonds are strong bonds, okay, in general. Okay, so these are all structural formulas. So in your outline, um, how do you show these in structural formulas? Structural formulas are exactly how the carbons are linked up to each other. It shows you what kind of bonds are between the atoms. It shows you the position of the atoms. So a structural formula gives you the structure of the molecule. So when you show a single bond, it's with one line. When you show a double bond, it's two lines. A triple bond is three lines. Okay, so the definition letter D, organic versus inorganic. Organic, again, is uh, carbon and hydrogen molecules, and inorganic is going to be, um, basically doesn't have those things. Um, let's answer this question first. So carbon can bind to a maximum of how many different atoms? The answer should be four. So now I'm just going to go through and just show you this is how diverse organic molecules can be because they can vary in how long the carbon chains are. If there's a double bond present, right, these look very similar. In fact, they have the same amount of carbons as they do hydrogens, but because the double bond is in different places, they have different shapes and they are different molecules. This is a branch. This is rings. You can have all single bond rings. You can have some double bonds in those rings. So um, lots of diversity in organic molecules because carbons tetravalence. Okay, so let's talk about um, macromolecules. So a macromolecule is a large molecule and they are the three groups I have listed here, carbohydrates, proteins, and nucleic acids are polymers. Now I left one out, lipids is not here because lipids are not polymers. What's a polymer? Right? A polymer is a big molecule, but it's made by putting together or stringing together many small, very, very similar molecules called, um, and the, the generic word is monomer, right? Poly means many, mono means one. So in this example, here's a string of these blocks, and then each block is called a monomer. When you put them together, you create a polymer, okay? So let's just begin with this concept. When you create a macromolecule that is made as a polymer, all you need to do is attach a monomer to the growing string and you have a polymer. If you want to break the polymer down, all you need to do is break these covalent bonds, right? So when you build macromolecules, the chemical reaction is called a dehydration reaction. And you, when you break down your macromolecules, it's called a hydrolysis reaction. So I want to just point out the word lysis here because we're, we're going to say lysis quite a bit in biology. Lysis is to break open or to break down. So if you have something called a hydrolytic enzyme, the word lytic refers to lysis. If a cell were to lyse, um, that means it broke open. Okay, it's just ruptured. So lysis is destructive and breaking down. Hydro refers to water. So when you break down macromolecules, you use water to break them down. So let's look at the next slide. So this is an example of um, dehydration and hydrolysis. We want to figure out which one's which. So here we have an example of a short polymer and we have a monomer and we want to add that monomer onto the polymer to make a longer polymer. So when you do this, what happens is there's a hanging OH and a hanging H, and when you add these two together, the H and OH go away and they make water. So you lost water. When you lose water, you're dehydrated, right? You're losing water, you feel thirsty. So this is a dehydration reaction. So you're making something bigger, you're building a macromolecule, and the reaction is called dehydration reaction. So that blank here should be dehydration. Okay, so just like here, when you build macromolecules, it's called dehydration. In your outline, that first picture is basically this, right? In the second picture, it's hydrolysis. So look, we have a molecule of water. That's the hydro. We want to break this apart. We're going to break this covalent bond, and the water does that. So it kind of goes back to this scenario, right? So using water, we broke our, our bond. So that's hydrolysis, hydrolysis. So hydro hydrolytic reactions break 
down bigger molecules. Now, this is a little bit trickier. Which reaction releases energy and which reaction requires energy? When you build up substances, when you, let's think about muscle, because that's a really easy one to think about. If you build muscle, if you want to become stronger and you want um, bigger muscles, people work very hard at that, right? You have to not only exercise, but you have to eat a lot of energy. So when you want to build bigger molecules, this actually requires energy. Energy is required or needed to do this process. So which one requires energy? It'll be the dehydration reactions to build bigger polymers. The opposite reaction would be the opposite in terms of energy. So when you break down bonds, you release that energy. So think about eating food. When you eat um, an apple, you are breaking down the, the sugar in that apple. When you break that down, your body can use those broken down nutrients to make energy. So hydrolysis, hydrolytic reaction or hydrolysis releases energy when it happens. Um, so number two, what kind of reaction breaks down macromolecules into its monomers? The blank should be hydrolysis, right? Okay, so now let's talk about, so now that we kind of know how um, some of these are made, well, let's talk about each one. So the carbohydrates, proteins, and nucleic acids, number four, those are all polymers. There's an exception to the rule, lipids are not polymers, and this is a really fat cat. Um, and I have to say a word of caution, do not have your cat get that fat because my cat got nowhere near this fat but developed diabetes, so I have a diabetic cat, <laughs> um, FYI. All right, number one. So let's look at carbohydrates first, okay? So when you think carbs, you probably think bread, pasta, things like that, but sugars are also parts of your carbohydrates. So carbohydrates, the smaller molecules are your sugars and your larger molecules are your starches, the things that you find in potato and pasta and bread. So the terms that you find in carbohydrates is monosaccharide, disaccharide, oligosaccharide, and polysaccharide. So let's look at your notes. Number one, what is the monor? What's the building block of all of your carbohydrates? They are called monosaccharides. This is the smallest unit, right? Because mono means one, and saccharide is sugar. This is an example of a monosaccharide. So there's, there's a lot of them out there. I'm only going to focus on glucose because glucose is uh, really important for your body, your own cells, to create energy. Glucose is going to be your, your monosaccharide to remember, okay? Um, this is the linear chain. It turns out that this is the organic molecule, the carbon backbone. You see that carbon backbone and then lots of hydrogen. So this is organic carbon and hydrogen. It folds up into a ring. So when it goes into water, it makes a ring. So glucose is always pictured as a little hexagon. The sugars are actually always pictured as a little hexagon. Okay. So this is a one sugar molecule, a monosaccharide. And you can use this to build bigger sugars. So what's a disaccharide? A disaccharide is two sugars hooked up together. Now, remember I said there's lots of monosaccharides out there. So here's our glucose, okay? When you add glucose to a fructose, many of you guys have heard of this before, right? Because we know there's like high fructose corn syrup in our um, sodas and fructose is actually the sugar that's in fruit. That's why it's called fructose. But if you add those two together in a chemical reaction, you make sucrose. So sucrose is a disaccharide. It's two sugar molecules chemically bonded together. And so is lactose. So lactose, I'm sure lots of you guys have heard of lactose. That's the sugar in milk, is also a disaccharide, right? And then this one actually has galactose. This is actually from a different language. That For English, that's the letter C. Galactose and glucose create a molecule lactose. So do not worry about memorizing what creates sucrose and what creates lactose. I want you to understand the concept of monosaccharides build disaccharides, and then they can also build bigger carbohydrates like oligosaccharides and polysaccharides. What is the function of our monosaccharides and disaccharides? It's, they're both, if you look at both of them, the function is to give very quick uh, sugar to the cells, energy to the cells. This is basically as broken down as sugar can get. 
one glucose, I mean, your body will actually break it down further. But in terms of your digestive system, this is the, the smallest it will get and the glucose will go inside of your cells. Your body will actually break down sucrose. So you have enzymes. We'll talk about enzymes in chapter five that will break the bond between these two monosaccharides and then you'll use the monosaccharides for energy. Lactose, same thing. Lactose is a sugar. It has calories. Um, it's found in milk um, and your body will cleave this bond to use the, the monosaccharides. So it's energy, very quick energy. One really cool thing, so I asked you guys to draw these in your notes. To draw a monosaccharide, you just leave out all the, the letters, just draw a little hexagon, just draw that shape. And then for a disaccharide, you just wanna draw two shapes and then link them together. Okay, that's a disaccharide. For lactose, if you are lactose intolerant or if you know someone who is, what does that really mean? It means that when you drink some milk that has lactose in it, it goes into your intestines and your body does not have the capability to break this bond. So other people do. So there's an enzyme out there, and I shouldn't say out there, it's in your body. There's an enzyme that your body creates that called lactase and the lactase enzyme will break down lactose. For some reason, people who are lactose intolerant, their body stops making that enzyme. So when they drink milk, there's no way for this bond in the middle here to be broken. So the, the lactose goes into their large intestine. Un, it's not broken down, it's just, just lactose. And then what happens is the bacteria, actually let me look, let's look at the lactose intolerant picture. The bacteria in your intestines will see that lactose because you didn't break it down and you didn't absorb it. So now the bacteria get it and the bacteria love lactose. So they're gonna take in the lactose. The bacteria are going to make lots of gas. They're gonna make an imbalance of your intestine and all kinds of intestinal issues like bloating and gas and upset, you know, upset stomach, all that stuff. That's your signs of lactose intolerance because the bacteria are eating the lactose that you could not break down. So if you are lactose intolerant or if you know someone who is, there's different percentages of lactose in different kinds of foods. You can see butter, there's very little lactose in it. So sometimes people are okay with eating butter, um, but they're not okay with eating ice cream, right? Because ice cream has a lot of lactose in it. Or they're not okay with drinking milk, um, but you know, the butter doesn't bother them. Some people can even eat cheese, some cheeses. All right, um, so that's lactose and that's a disaccharide. Let's move on to oligosaccharides. Um, let me actually get a picture of oligo. Okay, so this is an oligosaccharide for you. So we can see that there's one, two, three um, monosaccharides linked together. Um, so oligo means a few, so it's not one, it's not two, it's not a thousand, but it's somewhere in that middle area from three to 10 um, oligosaccharide, okay? And um, this, the function mostly of oligosaccharides is to act as little signaling molecules on the surface of your cells. So when we start looking at the cell membrane in chapter four, these little hexagon circles, right, that are linked on the surface of your membrane, those are oligosaccharides and they function, right? It's a carbohydrate and they function to signal to other cells of your body um, as to like what that other that cell is. So for example, an immune cell, um, a T cell will have certain carbohydrates on its surface and a B cell will have certain carbohydrates on its surface. And you know, so your immune system knows what cell is what. Um, your blood cells, the type of blood you are, so if you're type A, type B, or type AB, that's the kind of sugar group, the oligosaccharide you have on the surface of your blood cells. So it's an identifying um, flag, right, of what the cell is. So that's what the job of oligosaccharides are. And then the last one is polysaccharide. Oops, dang it. There we go, polysaccharides. And poly means many. So we're talking about hundreds to thousands of um, monosaccharides put together. And I want you to know the four different polysaccharides here. So first of all, the overall function for polysaccharides, there's two. One is energy storage. So notice that your quick usable energy was monosaccharides and disaccharides, your sugars. 
But if you wanted to store extra sugar, you store it in very long chains. You basically just create a big chain of the sugar molecules. And for hum for animals, right, humans and other animals, the way you store sugar is in the form of glycogen. Many of you guys probably had guessed fat, right? We know that fat is a kind of tissue that stores energy, but it stores it in the, in the in fat. Fat's not sugar. Your body can also store sugar. So there's two special places in your body where this happens, in your liver and in your muscles. So if you're um, exercising um, and you need more sugar for quick energy, your muscle cells can actually just clip off one at a time, right? It can start to break down your glycogen and then release those individual glucose molecules so that your cells can have immediate energy, so your muscles can work longer. Now, if you're an athlete um, or if you like working out, your glycogen stores can be depleted. So if you had a really big workout and you did a longer than usual run, for example, you can actually use up the glycogen that's in, stored inside your muscles. And so you're gonna have to eat to replenish that glycogen stores. Let's say you go for a really big run at night, you don't eat anything, you go to sleep, and in the morning you wanna do some more exercise, you're gonna be super tired. Your muscles are not gonna have that extra energy boost because the glycogen's all gone, okay? So glycogen, also if you're starving, if it's been like five hours since you've eaten anything, your body will start to break down the glycogen inside of the liver so that you can have some sugar to keep going because if you didn't have that, um, you would, you know, collapse <laughs> due to fatigue. Um, starch is the same, but in plants. So plants store their sugar in the form of starch. Animals store their sugar in the form of glycogen, okay? So starch is something we eat. Um, starch in potatoes, starch in bread, starchy foods is delicious. Um, and it's very caloric, right? Starch has a lot of calories because all of the sugar that's hooked up together, we can use that for energy. Calories is basically a, a measure of how much energy is in that food. The more calories, the more energy it gives you. So the same thing, you're, you eat the starch and your body can just start to clip off those individual sugar units and use that. Now, the other job of polysaccharides is structural component. So it builds up the cells. Letter C and letter D in your outline, chitin and cellulose is structural. I don't have a picture for chitin, but it looks just kind of like this and it's going to be part of fungi. So, the, so when you eat a mushroom, which is a fungus, um, the, you don't have a, a big crunch, right? But it's not completely mushy like if you ate a piece of ham. So fungi is somewhere in between because the substance that creates their cell wall is chitin. So chitin isn't as strong and rigid as cellulose. Cellulose is what builds um, plant cell walls. So if you bite into a celery, a uh, piece of celery or carrot, it's very crunchy because of the cellulose that builds their cell wall. Mushrooms aren't the same. It's not the same substance. It's still a polysaccharide. It's still something that you can get energy from, um, but it's just not at the same thing, so it's not as crunchy. And going back to the energy thing, cellulose is interesting because for us, for humans, we can't break down cellulose. So when you eat cellulose, our bodies cannot cut the bonds here. If you look really carefully at the bonds of cellulose and at the bonds of glycogen or starch, they're different. And um, it may not look completely different, it may look <laughs> the same, but if you study them, uh, they're different. So our, our, you remember I said shape of the molecule really determines how it behaves. So because of the slight differences in the shape and how the, the glucose molecules are arranged in cellulose, our bodies can't digest it. So it's zero calories when you eat vegetables and fruits, the reason why they're very low calorie is because there's so much cellulose and your body just can't digest it. So it goes through your body undigested and that's known as fiber. So really cool um, thing if you want to lose weight, you want to eat more fiber foods rich in fiber because it'll fill you up, you're getting food in your stomach, but it won't give you calories. Okay. All right, so those are chitin and cellulose. Moving on 
to proteins. I think it's been 25 minutes, so I'm going to pause it. We'll have a break, and then um, I'll do part two and finish, finish up. Okay, but before we finish up, I just noticed that there's this slide. Um, the high fructose corn syrup, I just want to make a, a quick um, FYI because we're in the carbohydrate topic. Um, corn has starch in it. So all those kernels of corn um, are, are very rich in starch. You know from this previous slide that starch is sugar, 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 just linked up together. Now, you can break starch down to glucose, and glucose can be converted to a sweeter fructose. So it turns out that on the tongue, on our tongues, fructose is sweeter than glucose. So if you want to make an extra sweet, sugary um, flavor, right, or sugar, you can take your glucose and make it into fructose. So this conversion process creates the high fructose corn syrup, okay? And that's what is in our, our beverages to make it really sweet. Um, it turns out that high fructose corn syrup is not very good for us. So if you think about the foods we eat, fructose is found in fruits, which is good, but we don't really usually eat you know, five pounds of fruit a day. So our bodies process fructose, but it doesn't process a lot of it. And high fructose corn syrup is processed differently than the fruit that's naturally, than the fructose that's naturally in fruit, and it's processed differently than glucose. And so when you have a lot of high fructose corn syrup, it's bad for your body. Um, it, it doesn't store it very well, and it can lead to different problems. So you want to stay away from too much high fructose corn syrup. It's hard to Stay away from it at all. It's in almost everything. But if you want to be a little bit conscious, um, you want to stay away from high fructose corn syrup if you can. All right, that's it.